going to start with uh, really a one-on-one, -on -one, a little you know crash course on sales and distribution because what we can control is the push side of our business right now. And I'm a big believer of this uh, saying, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going, right? So I think uh, what you can really do is build your pipelines, build your prospects in this phase, build your lead sheets, you know, really go into building your connections and that's how you can measure your success internally if you really want to see where you're heading. All right, so uh, just a quick one. So I can understand, I've done sales, you know, I come from a lot of street background. I've built my brand 200,000 cases. I had 10 private label brands. You know, I was also a wholesaler in New Jersey, Delaware. A lot of my family has liquor stores on East Coast. So I know that part of, you know, the trade a lot. Not winemaking and distilling, but I understand the street, what they want and how to work with the street. I'm going to go with a basic sales strategy. You know, you, you should have a winning portfolio and how you should sort of plan your growth. It's some, some of the things are obvious here, but it's good to sort of recap and to make sure that you are you know, pretty much following this. Uh, you are all experienced you know, big suppliers here, but I'm sure you know, if you have to really measure, this is some blueprint of a sales strategy. Old markets and new products. So first question is, have you penetrated this well? Like old markets and old products. So pick a state, for example, a couple of states, and make sure you're measuring your penetration as your number one goal. Have you covered as many retailers or restaurants in that particular state with the goal of depletion rate, sell-throughs? So that should be your first sort of winning metric. Once you think that, all right, enough, like I think I'm, I've reached a peak for my three brands, I need to, you know, I'm in New Jersey, I need to go to maybe Pennsylvania or New York. So the, the ideal strategy would be surrounding states. I'm talking more US here, you know, or East Coast. So that should be your next approach where, uh, you know, you, sorry, my bad. The next approach should be introducing and upselling another SKU to the old account. Why? Because you've won on the reputation, right? Like my reputation, my wine was called Friday Monkey Wine and everyone knew that my wine does sell. So I created that reputation and I can walk in with a product which has 100% markup and I can say, try this and put it on the shelf. But my, my loss leader or my horse was the main brand. So always have a performing brand that you are known for. But when you introduce, hey, Friday Monk is my wine, and then the guy will listen to you because it's selling in every store. And then you can take whatever, they'll give you a chance. So right, that would be my next play, that you go to the old accounts and take a new product extension and build your relationship there. And why it's important is you need to grow your relationship with the customer. How you can measure that is with the dollar sales or the repeat business, like how the big brands do it. Like, you know, there is a reason why Smirnoff will come out with watermelon flavor if, you know, the demand is there and they want to make sure the shelf game is never taken away, right? So what you're aiming for with that strategy is more business with the current accounts. Then comes the third play, which is new markets and old products. So you take your winning portfolio, you go to the next uh, neighbor store, and then you say, okay, we have some amazing success stories here, and I want to, I want to find a partner here. And obviously, you, you'll back it up with the data, you will have case studies, and that will be so easy way to open the next door state. You know, we've heard that from the talks as well. Like, if you have a proven case study, and you create a FOMO in the next state, it's a no-brainer for a distributor to pick your brand, especially the neighboring states. New markets and new products, I mean, I, I wish you good luck, but for example, to make a big name in a US market, you need to obviously have a million case sales, but once that is done, you can go to other markets and you can sort of, you know, eye for other international markets as well. So I would take this approach uh, and always aim that you can't grow at the cost of the current business. So again, a big believer of that. Do not expand if your current sale-throughs are going down. Fix that account because you're creating an artificial thing here. You know, you are completely creating a fake business model. If you do not face the music, if, you, if a retailer tells you your products are not moving, that should be your number one goal, you know, to, to sort of fix it at any, any cost, like do 100 times the tastings and make sure the product blows out. All right, so a sales process, again, five steps. You know, uh, this is to, this is to uh, re-emphasize. I'm sure most of you do not have, especially the scale of small and medium uh, wineries or breweries or distilleries, a, a, a disciplined way to sort of sell and open new states or new accounts. So what you need is 
have a preparation phase going through your company, which means are we really ready for mass distribution? Do we have all the sales material, the tools, the kits that the trade wants? This is nothing to do with, you know, we make amazing wines and our appellation is this or our vintage means this. This is completely the trade language. So the point of sale, shelf talkers, you know, contracts, uh, programming materials for agencies like IMI or chains, you know, everything that are you really ready for any question. A Kroger account will ask you immediately a UPC bar uh, code sheet, for example. So all the trade language should be in one folder. Then comes the prospecting. Do you have like data of 500 distributors? Do you have actual database of 400 sommeliers? Have you done your database building? Database is where you actually have to measure yourself and that's where you have to penetrate and make three fills. Like, you know, I'll, I'll go into that, but it's like prospecting, sample phase, sale done, and then repeat business. So you're, you, you always have to make sure that you are updating your record and you're monitoring and that's how you can measure your people as well. Uh, obviously you can use CRMs and other things to nurture your data. Uh, the second is uh, the closing, you know, how are you, like are you even paying attention that you're sending an email and email is not getting opened? Like have you changed your email contextually for today? Like uh, maybe uh, it says July in the title, maybe it says number three brand in Delaware, now looking for distributor in New Jersey. You know, so make it very contextual. And as, as we heard for the buyer as well that, hey Cami, I know, you know, uh, you like uh, let's say Pinot Grigio, and it's great for your this program. And you know what? We are number two sa selling Pinot uh, Grigio in next door state. So make it relevant. Pay attention. Again, go through your emails. Go through your everything, your phone, your spiel. We underestimate, you know, uh, the selling materials, and that's where the big brands pay attention. They're winning on pure sales talks and sales strategies like Gallo or Budweiser's of the world. So you got to understand your elevator pitch. What is your FAQ? I'm sure most of you don't have this, but I had an FAQ for the sales rep of 20 questions you can expect when you knock doors for my brand. How much? Why shall I buy? Why Australia is going down? Help them, you know? So write the real objection, which if you don't answer, if you're not capable to answer, how can you expect your sales reps or people selling out to answer? And it can be true as this category is not in demand. What do I do? So still have an answer, right? So write your FAQ sheet and that's what give it to distributors and they love doing business with you because you are an educated supplier. All right, so I already spoke about this. We're gonna go here and show you some, uh, you know, some other details. So uh, many ways you can sort of prepare, you know, your templates. And I'll, I'll show you this portfolio as an example as well. You know, how you, uh, can analyze a distributor portfolio and what you should do, what, how do you grow your relationship with the distributor? And my example here, let's say, of this portfolio of a distributor, Friday Monkey Wines are my wines. And I started with just 750ml Merlot, Shiraz, and Chardonnay. And you can see here how I expanded my relationship from 60,000 a year, let's say, to half a million a year with that wholesaler by product extensions, by bringing in, you know, whatever, you know, is available, uh, before my competitors like Lindemann and Jacobs Creek and Yellowtail take that space for that retailer as well, you know? So you always have to, uh, once you prove a relationship with the distributor, the best question to ask a distributor is, hey, I have a Chilean, let's say, uh, Lucky Seven was also my wine, so I have a Chilean brand. Before you add any other Chilean brand for this range, like 9.99 retail, give me a chance, and I'll make sure I'm the number one supplier for Chilean wines. So say that with like courage and back it up, right? And they will 100% want to work with the same supplier. Ease of business is very important as well. You know, same pickup location, mix and match, for many reasons for a distributor. It's, they'll actually prefer to not diversify and work with, you know, there is a reason why Southern Wines exist, right? It, it's convenient for the chains as well. So uh, this is how you penetrate the portfolio and then you go to find the gaps of the pricing as well. So, and I'll, I'll give you an example of Chile here. So Asunto Di Vino is, for example, 9.99 retail. The deck wines are 14.99 retail. Lucky Seven is 7.77 retail. Chilean Cis was my competitor. One more brand I'm sure uh, uh, some of you from Chile may know here, Mike. So amazing, aggressive guy. He used to come in the market and boom, boom, like sell four pallets and take back 10 pallets order, right? So, but what I did is, again, in all different price range, 
I was the one who made sure I won, won the 777 price range for the distributor, 999. So you can also understand that you got to position yourself for different price uh, ranges in that category. You can own that category, you know? And why it's important is you got to be a, a dependable supplier. Like, be, you know, one question which brands ask me is how do I become priority to the distributor? The answer is by making them more money. That's it, it's as simple as that. If the retailer really wants that product and if you are making retailer and the distributor make money, you become the priority. There is nothing else, you know how? Make them money. Here is something which you can take a picture of, like what is the pitch? What should your deck include? What do you, you know, what exactly distributor is looking for and what that meeting should look like? So what are you really selling to the distributor? You can say amazing things about why you started the brand, the, the craft story about it. I'm sure people respect that, the, the truth. But then you go in the business language of it, right? So you got to make them a real case study of how retailers, their accounts are going to make money, why retailers should buy all this stuff like minimum order, convenience, maybe. You know, I'll throw some things here so you understand what I mean by convenience. So I'm sure most of you may know Western carriers, let's say on East Coast and even in Napa, they have a warehouse, right? You know Western carriers, the big storage uh, third-party logistics company, l and Trucking, for example, you may know, or Old Dominion, I'm sure everyone knows. So use the standards, use them as your pickup location instead of one little boutique warehouse somewhere in Houston. You know, you should have New York, uh, New, EW, uh, West, New Jersey Western Carrier and this for this, for example, one maybe in the South, you know, Old Dominion and that's it, number one, number two, instead of some ABC trucking company. So y don't make them open or write a new form, right? They already are sending their trucks for their other wines. They will easily add a couple of layers of your products if it's expensive or a pallet in their truck. So that's called, that is an example of a convenience that you're giving. And that's the homework you got to do. You got to understand, you got to ask that question, hey, where do you store? Where is your most of your, what's your biggest supplier? And where do, where do they store? Is that East Coast, Western Carriers? All right, you know what? Let me also put my pallet there for you. So those kind of things is something which you talk in the meeting to make sure that you're making their life convenient. All other stuff is there as well. Uh, so we won't go much in detail there. Uh, the pickup location, obviously the freight cost. You got to understand that all this is part of their decision making. They may not be very clear to you, but this is what they are thinking. The number six question is the most important uh, because of the distribution bottleneck that we are going through. Unfortunately, that is the reality. They want us to do the sale sales. I mean, they want us to get the accounts. Uh, again, trust me, guys. Like, add more markup, but give everything to them. You do the sales, but. No one cares if your wine is $7.99 or $8.99 or $9.99. Keep that 24 bucks to operate the system, the new system we are in, you know, which is ourselves knocking the doors and opening accounts and servicing and whatnot. Consumers will pay $9.99 instead of you trying $7.99. So keep more money to, to pump back into the trade. Uh, here are some more points. Pallet configuration, like, you know, it's so weird, like sometimes you get 87 pallet breakdown go with the 60 14 layer five you know stack very like standard how does this most standard and, and the best way to go with is like what are the number three brands in the market see how their palette configuration looks like so you know go with very standard palette configurations 56 or 60 are standard 72 is good depending on the van or the truck the, the distributor is using uh, market sales rep dollars you know, per case and all that stuff. Access to chains is a big, big deal, you know. Anything that you uh, show them that you are even working, you know, you're, you're trying that effort that, hey, I'm going to, uh, you know, give, give me one year and I'll, I'll land you some regional chains like Festival Foods or Specs, for example. So at least give them a little uh, thing that you're working on the national or regional level as well. That helps a lot because they also want to grow. All right. So uh, we'll go to uh, an example because I want to give you a practical example. You can see the date. It's very old, but it still works. We are looking for a distributor partner in the state of Montana, and we are you know, very keen to discuss the proposal with this company. You know, uh, we are experienced company and understand what it takes to build a brand, right? That is, the, that's it. that is the key here. We are an educated supplier, and I know what it will take to build a brand. You know, so give me a chance to sort of uh, jump on a call and discuss. So that was my first email, like introduction email instead of attaching 100 things about my winery or 
you know, different kind of things. Uh, here is uh, the second email, the attachment, how simple my prize list looks like, right? It's FOB New Jersey, and then I have a DA and SPA program. If you buy, you know, let's say 10 pallets, I'll take care of the shipping. And then I backed it up with a supply guarantee as well, which is a big thing. Don't underestimate that. When someone is trying to take your brand and build a brand, the last thing you want to do is go out of stock. You know, uh, so please understand the importance of that. The sales rep has made finally a placement. You got the traction, and now, wow, one SKU is out of stock. So what I told them is anytime this happens, I'm going to buy from some other store and put it back. Okay, so you back your promises like that. I'm going to take care of free shipping in the next container. You know, so make sure you're backing your promises in your, in your partnerships as well. Sending samples, I'll give you one, a, a little tip here because it's practical again. So uh, as we send samples to the trade, you know, we are very stingy sometimes and I do understand it's expensive, but let's say why do we send two bottles? That's it, you know, you should send a full case in your real branded case, if it's available, and let's say if you're doing three SKUs, send four bottles each. You know why? Because this is how the most of the medium and small distributors make their decisions. On a Friday evening, you know, when they all come for their invoices or samples or this and that, their little six, seven people are in the room or maybe 10 people, even the mid-tier companies, Fridays for some sales meeting and, you know, going through the new products. Over there, half of the team is not there, maybe the owner is not there, the manager is not there, so you need extra bottle to revisit for that decision maker on a Monday. That is one extra bottle for sure. Then comes... You want to keep a bottle there in their warehouse just in case, you know, they come into the businesses and they forget about you. So you can always say, hey, John, you know what? There should be an extra bottle, I'm sure. So why don't you reopen and retaste it if, you've, if you just want to go back to the tasting and I'm attach the pricing again here. So use it as a reminder also because you always can say you have an extra bottle uh, sitting there. And guess what? You know, it will remind John again to see your bottle again and again, oh, you know what? I got to think about that supplier. So if you... I would send more bottles just to be in the memory of that distributor, and it's just like a couple of bottles more. Then the third use of this is they will go out and use it for pre-selling. You want that actually these days. You want them to go out in the market, take your five bottles, tell to the sales rep, hey, you know what, get, go and try this new wine before we make a decision and get some pre-orders. So it's a much bulletproof way of getting your payments you know, and getting your first purchase order that you actually force them to go out and do some pre-selling. Uh, building your networks, I was just chatting with, I think a couple of, uh, I think maybe we were chatting about Miller Network and Budweiser Network, right? So I was explaining how I tapped into the beer network and why, and that was a very strategical play. Uh, so how this networks work, guys, is either you pick the Southern Network Glazers or mid-tier distributors or Mil Budweiser Network or you know, uh, Coors Miller Network. So you got to be in a network in that region. If you really perform well with one, let's say, Burke Beverage in Chicago, boom, the Midwest will love you. And that guy will call his 15 beer distributors within like six months. You know what? You know, the beer guys, I mean, they're amazing, right? Like, hey, you know, Sid's an awesome guy. Take his wine. So the, the, the old, I mean, I, I guess the, the old experienced generation works still this way. That, hey, I think this guy... Uh, can put in effort and work. So beer guys are amazing, I would say. Uh, Southern guys obviously needs more uh, chain accounts and they'll take your products more to fulfill the chains. But I think uh, pick the network so there is a synergy there and then you can use that network, maybe have the that location stock a container and then the regional beer guys can pick a couple of pallets here and there. So that is an amazing way to sort of expand your distribution as well. We all know self-distribution and models like MHW, Park Street, LibDib, you know, are there. So I think you all should uh, look at, uh, I mean, suffocate the excuse that there is no distributor. So try to eliminate that. Destiny is in your control. You know, there are options there. There is everything there today. You can actually ship to any consumer and you can actually knock any door in America and your case can be fulfilled. You just have to put in the work basically, right? So try to suffocate yourself out of that excuse of, hey, I'm not getting a distributor. You can always start this and hand that business to the distributor later on. So I'll uh, pretty much go in the ending slides here. Uh, depletion is the only thing that matters. Every time it was the only thing. It, you know, even people are nice sometimes, they don't say it directly, but if you are not selling in that account, if you're not getting a repeat business, that is a great sign 
uh, that you need to uh, be proactive about it. There is something called depletion reports, which I'm sure you guys may know. If not, it is a report that you ask your wholesaler, hey, send me monthly depletion report of my products, and it will show you which retail accounts your products were listed in and how the sell-throughs were there. And if I was you, when I go to the market visit, I want to visit my top 10 sell-throughs. I want to visit my top 10 problems, and that's how I would plan my market visit. <clears throat> Uh, again, a little uh, growth uh, hack, let's say, you know, network of retailers and type of retailers is very important. So why you want to go in Total Wine, you know, it's a very clear strategy you should have. Why do you want to go in Cipriani Wall Street is a very clear strategy. Why buy right? How this co-ops of, let's say, New Jersey liquor stores buy their product and what they're looking for is a very different thing. Why Frank's Wine? Because that was the most prestigious newsletter of Delaware, you know, that I can use to build credibility for my 7.99 wine. So my angle was to prove to the retailers by getting a, I was a house poor in Cipriani Wall Street, right? So that is very high-end restaurant in New York. So my objection to all the trade was gone on day one. My wine is a house port in Cipriani Wall Street, it's $7.99. Like, I'm, I don't have to worry and explain about quality now, right? So use this for your sale, sales spill. So when I knocked every door, I can say that, hey, we are in all buy right to any small distributor, or let's say, so be, use this, throw some names in a tactical way to keep on going. Uh, so sometimes even if you have to do a break, like Total Wine was pure, I wanted to go into their winery direct program because I know the amount of scale I would get by putting liquid in consumer's mouth and creating awareness was insane. Like we were selling 40 cases a week, I think, in just like Maryland and Delaware, just in I think four or five total wines. But what that was doing is imagine every Friday my wine was on some house dinner table and more and more people were drinking, right? So that was a pure strategy of instead of me doing tastings at 100 places, total wine was just putting the liquid out there. Uh, all right, so I mean, I think I'm pretty close to ending, but uh, just some of the things that you can always do is to find distributors. We, we go back to that, is a couple of other small hacks here. You can go to the distributors, see their portfolios, open the, what other winery from that region is there, go back to that distribution page of that winery, find more distributors, and that loop is you know, an ongoing, uh, a good loop, good way to find database for distributors as well. We all know the TTB list as well of new licenses. You can find, you know, new permits that come because new guys are always looking for new products, so that's a great way to find new distributors as well. Okay, uh, for the metrics, I would go with this. What, what I used to do, for example, if it's just a small company, you know, just have a few SKUs, 80 cold calls, you have to do, you know, in a month, for example, uh, 24 to the second phase, eight samples was my target, that eight samples every month I have to send out. You know, am I on track or not? And two deals closed, right? So this is how you can internally, depending on how much you want, what your ambition is, you can do your targets. But the conversion ratio should be like this. Like, if I called 80 people, 24 should say, you know, yeah, send me more information. If I say send 24, he said, you know what, send me samples. If I send eight samples, you know, I'm expecting two deals, and, and finally we all know one actual contract happened. You know, so that, that is the benchmarks that I used, otherwise something is wrong with the process. You know, and needless to say, product is a real thing, you know, like if obviously it's crazy priced, and I'm, I'm assuming it's a great value for the liquid that you are. So we are not uh, considering quality and price here, but the, all other things that go. All right, I think, thank you very much.